thanks for inviting me to talk today uh, on our work on developing a totally artificial kidney. Um, this is my disclosure slide. And I thought before I started uh, going over the work that we're doing, uh, I just wanted to make the point that many of you know already that uh, dialysis um, has been around for a long time. As you know, it changed nephrology from what used to be um, a palliative care specialty to a chronic disease management specialty. It also allowed the development of kidney transplantation to take place. And hemodialysis has been around for about 60 years, peritoneal for about 40 years, but the dialysis space has, as you all know, been stagnant for for all these years, very little technical development. And I thought because of that, I would, for the fellows especially, I would go back a little bit and go over the history of hemodialysis, which is an interesting one. Uh, and so it was really the in mid 1800s when uh, Thomas Graham published his important paper on the diffusion of uh, liquids, the Royal Society. And he actually coined the term dialysis, which comes from the Greek, dialin, dia meaning apart, and lean meaning loosening. It was the first time the, the word appeared in the, in the English literature. And in 1913, uh, Abel and colleagues dialyzed uh, animals, uh, directing blood through what were called colloidian membranes based on cellulose. Uh, and uh, heparin wasn't around at the time. They used uh, what was called heridin. It's an anticoagulant from leech saliva. But it was 1924 that George Haas uh, performed the first human dialysis treatments. And a few years later, he had dialyzed an additional six patients, um, none of whom survived. And he also used uh, heridin initially because of the severe allergic reactions that occurred, which um, eventually changed to heparin. And here's a picture of him performing dialysis at the University of Gießen. William Koff, though, is, is considered the father of dialysis. There's a picture of him in the upper right with his wife, uh, Janky, in 1941. And it was during World War II, uh, he had moved to a very small hospital in uh, Nazi-occupied Holland to escape the Nazi sympathizers who were put in charge of his hospital at Groningen. And then he began his work there on the first dialysis machine after watching uh, a young man die of renal failure. And he began bench experiments with um, sausage casings, saline, and urea. Um, he took uremic blood, circulated it through the cellulose tubing, uh, and then used a motorized drum uh, through what was a stationary dialysis bath to get the diffusion of the toxins into the bath. Uh, and he used, in 1943, this rotating drum device um, for the first effective treatment of AKI. And shown here in the picture is what the sausage casing looked like. It's basically cellulose. Uh, and it allowed a semi-permeable membrane to allow the diffusion of the urea, urea and, other, and other substances. The membrane was about two and a half meters squared, which is about the surface area of what we now use, hollow fiber kidneys. To start the treatment, the blood was drained from the patient into a jug, and then he added the anticoagulants. He filled the jug, hung, hung it up because um, it was gravity uh, driven and then the blood went around the cellular, the, the, the sausage casing around this wooden drum. Um, the, the device was primed with a few units of blood. Um, there was no blood pump and then the rotation of the drum with an electric motor caused the blood to, to flow through. When the so-called clean blood uh, came out, it went into a second jug that he then raised again and had that go back into the patient. It took about six hours. Uh, he then eventually moved to the Peter Bent Brigham, and George Thorne, uh, who was the chairman of medicine, uh, invited him to work with Carl Walter, who actually created the first uh, blood bank uh, at the Peter Bent Brigham, with John Merrill, the famous nephrologist, um, to redesign the rotating drum machine. And it actually uh, was used to support the first uh, kidney transplant program in the United States, the first Transplant was actually done at the bottom right. There's John Merrill showing the dialysis machine. And here are the two Herrick twins, uh, um, where Richard Herrick received from his brother the first ever kidney transplant. Uh, he was 23 when he got the transplant. He died about eight years later from an MI. And in this device, they continue to use the sausage casing 
membrane that was wrapped around the drum, but this time it was connected to uh, tubing that could be attached to the patient's bloodstream. Uh, and it was eventually commercialized by Edward Olson in 1950 at a cost of 5,600. Kauf went on to work on uh, other uh, entities such as the artificial lung, the artificial eye, and the Jarvik 7 heart. As far as the history of peritone peritoneal dialysis, it's an interesting one. It was 1550 BC uh, when the first known recorded reference to the peritoneal cavity appeared in what was called the Ebers papyrus in Egypt. And the peritoneum is, uh, word peritoneum is from the Greek peritoneum, which means to stretch around. And this has an interesting history also. In 1826, Dutrochet first described the process of osmosis and Graham in 1861 distinguished between crystalloids and colloids for the first time. Wegener demonstrated in animals that the peritoneal distillation of hypertonic solutions actually increased the volume of the peritoneal cavity. And in 23, 1923, Gatner first used PD clinically, he put hypertonic saline in two patients with renal failure. In, in 1927, Husser and Werder tried peritoneal lavage with two separate catheters, an inflow and an outflow catheter for patients with mercury poison, who, poisoning who ultimately died. In 1946, Frank Seligman and Fine reported recovery from uh, of, of AKI with a patient after four days of, of getting peritoneal lavage for the first time. And in 59, Ruben was the first to use PD successfully for a patient with ESRD who survived uh, about half a year. In 1962, the PD cycler was, was invented. In 68, the Tankoff catheter uh, came to the fore with two Dacron cuffs creating a paradigm shift in PD. Uh, in 1973, Bab actually showed that the peritoneal permeability was bidirectional, blood to the peritoneal cavity and vice versa. And then in 78, Popovich and Moncrief took a more mathematical approach and came up with the theoretical equations for mass transfer that actually led to uh, what became known as CAPD based on their modeling. In 78, uh, Oreopolis used the first plastic bags instead of glass bottles. And then in 1980, uh, Buon Cristiani developed the Y-set, which was the single most significant uh, factor in preventing infections in patients with CAPD. So all these changes have been around for, for quite some time um, for the renal fellows and others um, on the, on the call. Really nothing has changed over all these years. And the federal government in 2016 recognized this through a number of initiatives in 2016, the White House Organ Summit called for increased breakthroughs in research and development in patients um, for, uh, who were needing kidney transplants. And in 2019, the Kidney Health Initiative published its roadmap for uh, initiatives to, to improve approaches to renal replacement therapy, any approach. And then in 2019, the Kidney X Prize was established, which was really the first of its kind, a public-private partnership between Health and Human Services and the ASN, providing prize money for uh, engineers, scientists, and, and, and other uh, innovators to try to make changes in the way patients who need dialysis are managed. And in 2019, the FDA approved, uh, its, break, approved its Breakthrough Devices Program for technologies along these lines. In 2019, the president issued an executive order advancing kidney health, and there were really three main components. Uh, one was to um, come up with ways of preventing kidney failure through better diagnosis, treatment, uh, and incentives. The second was to increase the choice that was affordable for patients with ESRD, including developing an artificial kidney. And then the third was to increase access to kidney transplant. So here are some of the uh, initiatives that people have been working on for a number of years now. And I'll just go through all of these and give you my thoughts about where we are, where they're going, the chance of success, et cetera. So a number of people are trying to come up with, a number of entities are trying to come up with a portable peritoneal dialysis. The thought is that if you can have a patient work during the day um, with something that is portable attached to their bodies, then they could get more long-term peritoneal dialysis. The other 
uh, thought was that we use a huge volume of solutions. Every time we instill the solution, it's about two liters, sometimes a little more depending on the size of the patient. So the thought was if we're gonna have something portable, we can't be continually hanging bags on a human being who's walking around or who's at work. So a number of these um, devices have been uh, attempted by a number of entities. The AWAC is probably the most well-known in Singapore, WeKid in the Netherlands, Renard in Russia. Uh, they all have these strange names that you don't really need to memorize, but you can just see that a, lar a large number of countries and entities are working on these things. This list may not even be exha exhaustive currently, but they all have the same um, type of phenomenology. There's a purse size controller with batteries that the patient carries. You need something to rejuvenate the uh, dialysate because you can't have the same volume. These things use about a half a liter of dialysate. You need a pump uh, and different reservoirs. Um, the device will automatically continuously remove dialysate. It will then regenerate it, which is really the brains behind the thing. You need to have the um, chemistry to be able to run the dialysate through something to turn it back into its original chemistry. And that's really the hard part. And then reinfuse it back in the patient. And this occurs about eight times an hour. Um, there's something called a dialysate cartridge. Uh, that's the part of the device that actually regenerates the uh, dialysis. And it's all through binding. Uh, so you have stuff that binds uh, phosphate, binds ammonium. I don't know if some of you remember the, the old ready machine that used to be around used to use it at UCLA, it was a similar principle. It had a very small dialysate volume because it could regenerate the dialysate. And then periodically the patient needs to infuse fresh dialysate. Now these projects, especially the AWAC have been around for a number of years and they've still not led to anything clinical. Uh, AWAC is currently doing a preclinical study in Singapore and they're hoping in 2025 to have a larger trial in the US they have published their data if you're interested in looking at it. Now, the other thought, and it's a similar thought, is just shrink a hemodialysis machine. Uh, and so actually this idea is not a new one. Uh, it was actually first published in 1976 by Stevens and colleagues. It was called a portable wearable artificial kidney uh, whacked uh, initial evaluation. And basically, it's a hemodialysis machine, which is smaller, that you can carry around. It's also being done currently by Victor Gura, who's a private nephrologist at Cedar sinai This is Victor carrying around his device. Um, but basically, every, it's just a dialysis machine that has everything shrunken. It still uses the same technology, the same same bio, same biological requirements and needs. It's it's uh, it's really not anything new technically. I mean, there are technical advances, but it's more in shrinking everything down to a smaller size. There are other companies trying to just shrink dialysis machines in general. The Next Kidney in the Netherlands is developing a suitcase size machine. Quanta in the UK has a tabletop machine. Um, but there are problems with these devices, and um, it's. Uh, particularly Victor Gura's device. There's clotting, um, ammonia and, and carbon dioxide increase because they have a process which breaks down urea. Well, the byproducts of urea are carbon dioxide and ammonia. There can be battery failure, gas bubbles, line kinking. They've done some um, clinical uh, trials um, in, in a few patients, but my, my gut feeling about this is it's going to be very hard to get any human being to walk around with this. And the real question is why you'd have to walk around with it. Um, it makes more sense to me to have a small device that you can have on a tabletop, like Quanta uh, and some of these other companies, Next Kidney are doing. But the thought that someone's going to be walking around all day and needing to have this on their waist, to me, is just doesn't make sense to me. So I'm not quite sure why Victor's going this route. Uh, it makes more sense if you're going to shrink something, at least in my mind, to make a tabletop device and the patient can hook up to the device either at home or at work. Removing the urea either in the PD devices or in the hemodialysis devices is difficult. Um, there's a number of ways to do it, all of which have technical issues. Uh, there are comp newer compounds called mixines. 
they're two-dimensional titanium carbide compounds. These things have a very high affinity for urea. And so one thought is to use these as a sorbent to bind the urea. And then once they're fully saturated with urea, you replace the cartridge. But this, this is uh, one, one way uh, people are thinking of removing urea from recir recirculating uh, dialysate. And then, of course, there's the biological approach, the enzyme urease, which breaks down urea into ammonia and carbon dioxide. But now you've got two gases that are being created in your device with the fear of getting uh, the gases coming out of solution and getting bubbles. So that, um, and also you've got a biological enzyme that has to continue to work outside of, a, of, of an organism. Then there are other ways to break urea down that are called electrooxidation with or without photooxidation um, using a titanium oxide catalyst. Again, these things make gases. You don't make ammonia, you make a nitrogen and carbon dioxide gas. And these are being attempted by uh, a number of groups. Uh, and then there's thermolysis where you, if you heat a solution to a high enough temperature, urea will start breaking down. So all these are interesting approaches and have uh, problems. Then there's the well-known UCSF implantable artificial kidney device. And basically uh, what they purport to, to want to do is to have two components to the device. One will be um, basically like a, a glomerular component, an ultrafiltration component. Uh, this is what, and they've made it out of silicon. It's called their silicon nanofilter. But for the ion transport, uh, they plan to use cultured cells. And uh, this is where I have a problem with, with that thought. First of all, the kidney has 45 different cell types at least. And when you take a cell and put it into culture, uh, it does not retain its transport properties. In fact, no one has ever come up with uh, a cell or cell line uh, that replicates the transport properties of any cell in the nephron. Um, the closest people come to it is what are called primary cells in culture, where you take a cell out of the any tissue, it doesn't have to be the nephron, and then culture it. Um, and then in, initially it does express the same proteins, but if you follow the cell with time, and especially if you passes the cell by splitting it, the, the message, the transcripts that are created are very different. And it's because the cell recognizes the environment it's in. So that's one, one problem. Um, and these cells are not just different, they have different ion transporting uh, properties. And so um, no one has replicated uh, any of, all or any of the cell dependent transport properties in vitro. And also these cells would have to function predictably for a very long time. Uh, the function of the kidney, as many of you know, is not just determined by the two-dimensional or sort of linear um, uh, processes that occur, but there's three-dimensional crosstalk between not only tubules, but also the uh, veins, arteries in the kidney, and that sort of thing. So the final functionality that you get is, is highly complex. Plus, you have to prevent rejection. So far, they've used um, a cultured pig kidney cell line. It's called an OK cell line uh, that people over the years have said is proximal tubule-like. But Mark Nepper has clearly shown that the transcripts that uh, uh, this cell line expresses are, depending on which one, there are three types, uh, can be anywhere from like 17 to 45 percent of the transcripts the proximal tubule expresses. So. Uh, they have published papers on their silicon filter, but the problem is it's basically ultrafiltration. Um, in order to transport sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, phosphorus, calcium, and magnesium uh, that matches roughly the dietary, the net dietary intake of these things, and in a regulated fashion, um, is going to be impossible in my view with cells. And I think even though they keep pushing this, um, they're sort of changing what they what they plan to do at least, but they they've got a lot of uh, press and PR. Then the NIH is putting tens of millions of dollars into um, what they call rebuilding a kidney, rebuilding a kidney, and this has many many components, including the structural components, the cells, uh, nephron progen. I mean, it's very complicated. A lot of people are getting money from this, but 
my feeling about this is it's a highly complicated problem, um, especially with stem cells that people love to talk about because of the need to get everything functioning in the correct spatial organization. I always say it would be easier for me to build a 7, 747 from stem cells than it would be a kidney. It's just something that I don't think is ever going to occur, uh, at least in my lifetime. We'll see. But USC uh, just got uh, one of the Kidney X prizes for their stem cell uh, projects. And what they purport to plan to do is to make these thousands of little organoids. Uh, organoids are structures that you might have heard of that are made from cells. They don't have the function or the anatomy of the original organ, but they express some of the cells. Their architecture is totally different. People are doing it to make so-called, you know, mini brains in a dish and all sorts of things. You can find organoids just about on any organ now. But the thought is to make these little organized organoids and then hook them all up and somehow that will create a kidney with its functionality. Again, I can't see how this is going to work. Maybe they, they know something I don't know. There's another company called uh, Miro Matrix. What they're purporting to do is to take pig kidneys, and they're doing it with uh, also livers, not just kidneys. Um, and get rid of all the cells, first of all, what they call a decellularize, and leave just the structure. So it'd be like removing everything in the building you're in and only having the structure, the 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 uh, steel poles and the 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 fine outer structure of the building, but everything else would be gone. And then they plan to uh, put in a solution uh, of stem cells. And these, this shown here in this, no, oh, cannot play, okay, it was playing before. It just shows the um, solution going into a decellularized uh, liver. But the thought is that they would repopulate the entire kidney structure with human stem cells uh, again, I think this is a pipe dream. It would be like having um, all the furniture and pictures and tables in the building you're in, everything except the outer shell of the building, and then somehow having a river of all these things go into the building, and magically they would find the room they were in before, they would go up on the wall like they were before. I just can't see how this can occur. Uh, again, they're going to have to generate 45 different kidney cell types from stem cells, which no one has done uh, anything close to even one yet with all the transport properties of the original nef nephron cell, for instance. Uh, and again, they would have to repopulate the scaffold in the correct anatomical location. And again, the cells would have to work for a prolonged period of time. And, and again, unless it's your own cells, there's gonna be potentially rejection, um, rejection episodes. Oops. Other biological approaches are um, a little more uh, thoughtful and possibly successful. George Church. So the idea is to transplant um, an animal's kidney into humans. It's called a xeno, xenograft, a xenotransplant. Um, and George Church uh, created eGenesis in 2015, their goal was not to worry initially about the rejection episode, but about the PERVs. PERVs are porcine endogenous retroviruses in the pig genome. So there's about 62 sites in the pig genome that make retroviruses. And the thought is, if you even if you solve the rejection issues, if you implant one of these kidneys into into a patient, you could potentially have all these viruses uh, that are suddenly going to be expressed and kill the patient. So they actually made, um, uh, in 2017, per-free pigs, which they have now. Uh, the FDA is not so sure this is going to be a problem. People are still arguing whether these PERVs can be transferred to human cells or not. There's a lot of stuff being done in cell culture in vitro with human cells. Um, so it, it seemed, it, it, at least emotionally, it seems to be less of a, a worry than it was before. Another big company called United Therapeutics, this was founded by Martine Rosenblatt, who actually created serious 
radio, his daughter had uh, uh, pulmonary fibrosis or pulmonary hypertension, I think it was. And he, in addition to trying to find new drugs um, with this company, wants to create uh, an endless supply of organs for not only people who need lung transplants, but for any transplant. And it was actually, uh, I think a few months ago, they just acquired Mirror Matrix, the company that's infusing the stem cells into that scaffold, into the decelluloid scaffold. They, they just bought Mirror Matrix. And they're very serious. They're creating helipads in Texas with large farms of animals uh, that uh, will have their organs harvested and flown either regionally or do this, you know, in different regions of the U.S. Uh, but uh, they're putting hundreds of millions of dollars into xenotransplantation. And as you might have heard, the University of Alabama and New York University uh, have recently transplanted um, kidney from pigs into brain dead humans. Um, this company, Revivacor, you probably have heard of, is uh, involved in both. They've knocked out the alpha gal gene in the kidney, uh, which causes uh, hyperacute rejection. So that problem has been solved. Uh, so these uh, people are getting their kidneys from Revivacor. At, in, at Alabama, they actually made additional modifications with four gene knockdowns and knockouts. They put in six uh, human transgenes. I won't get into the molecular biology, but it was a much more complicated kidney transplant uh, than and NYU, which basically just transplanted the alpha-gal knockout uh, kidney. And... Uh, I've got the citations here. Um, these, you know, th this data has now been published. It's not leading to a success yet, but uh, this has been something that people have been working on for years and years and years, and ultimately it will work. Uh, when it does, uh, nephrology, outpatient dialysis, and kidney transplantation are going to have a sea change because basically now you'll be able to um, transplant many of the patients who are on chronic dialysis now, uh, and there'll be a constant supply of new patients going into ESRD. It's estimated once this becomes viable the first year, about 20 or 30,000 patients in the U.S. will be transplanted. Obviously, there'll be a need for a whole infrastructure. Another thing that will be needed will be training of, potentially training of transplant nephrologists, and nephrologists also because uh, the, the pig's kidney physiology, especially with its water transport, is, is different than humans. So there'll have to be some learning from uh, the nephrology aspect in order to manage manage these patients. But the what the FDA wants is not that the kidney won't be rejected, but just that we'll be able to use the anti-rejection medications we're currently using. That's that, That's the goal. Another interesting approach uh, is this pig human endothelial cell chimera. This was published uh, a few years ago in scientific reports. The thought behind this was you don't have to have the whole kidney um, um, matching or treated uh, like these other approaches. Their thought was to just replace the endothelial cells. So if they can replace the endothelial cells with human endothelial cells, then if you plant this organ, the blood will only see human surfaces. It won't see a foreign surface, and perhaps that will help the rejection. So what they did is they took endothelial cell progenitor cells. They, they come from the placenta, and you can HLA type them in ABO, match them, et cetera, et cetera. You put them then into uh, the pig kidney or a kidney from another animal or liver, and then once the cells have lined every vessel in that organ, you can then transplant that organ uh, into a human. So I thought this was an interesting idea. I haven't seen anything further clinically from it. It was more just a conceptual uh, proof of concept paper. So with all this background, when we decided to work on this, uh, we decided to follow the um, follow what the Wright brothers did, and that is stay away from anything biological, uh, both because of the complexity of replicating what nature did, and also because the Wright brothers showed that they could succeed in, 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 in having a 
aircraft that flew without having to model the wings and the rest of the plane after bird wings like other people were actually doing at the time. These are some real pictures of what people thought might work in heavier than air, air, air aircraft. And clearly they showed that, that uh, one doesn't need to do it. The same th arguments are occurring with AI and what people are trying to do with AI, whether you need to actually replicate what the human brain does biologically or whether just understanding principles of how it works creates something totally different that nature de didn't do. And we decided to take the latter approach. So the question then was, what are the, fu so what are the functional requirements to, cre uh, to create uh, what we call an artificial kidney? The first thing is you need to ha have an ultra filtrate of blood uh, preventing uh, filtration of cells, albumin, globulin into the synthetic urine. You also have to prevent the filtration of glucose, uh, but allow the excretion of urea, ions, and water. And the reason it has to be on a filtration basis is because we have no way currently, unlike the tubule, we don't have SGLT1 and 2. Uh, that, that from an engineering or chemical engineering sense, we don't know how to transport glucose uh, artificially outside a biological process. So um, the way we thought we would have to do it is to prevent getting through the filter to begin with. Nature doesn't do it that way. It lets everything through the filter and then it reabsorbs it all back into the blood. Sort of an inefficient process, but maybe nature couldn't create a filter that would reject glucose also. And then you have to be able to transport and these are just some of the major ions, not all of them, uh, dynamically, and also uh, so that their excretion in the synthetic urine matches the net GI absorption from the diet. Same thing with water. The water excretion, the volume of what the synthetic urine is, would have to dynamically change and match what the net GI, roughly what the net, obviously there's water losses elsewhere, but the in and out would have to be equal. And then perhaps there would be uh, the ability of this thing to help with uremic toxin excretion. That This happens to be a real difficult problem because um, as some of you might know, most of the uremic toxins are protein bound. And so they don't even get through the glomerulus. And a lot of them are handled uh, via transport in the tubule. In fact, many of them, it's not known how, how they get into the final urine or whether they do at all. And then the whole topic is a very complicated one because there's about 150 compounds now that are reported to be uremic toxins. It's a very messy literature, and the clinical studies clearly have not been done uh, appropriately for a clinician to know what is actually uh, pathophysiologically important or not. But everybody talks about endoxyl sulfate and beta-2 microglobulin, um, et cetera. And then if it's going to be implantable, one can't use external water dialysis or a dialysate. And what I always say is that creating an artificial kidney is significantly harder than creating an artificial heart uh, or pancreas, just because we use the word kidney, but it's really, as most of you know, an organ that does many, many, many different things. It just all happens to be anatomically in something we call a kidney. So the new technology had to be created um, that did not use dialysate, water, um, dialysis, or anything biological, no cells. Now, that would have other benefits too. I don't know if, if you know, but about six and a half billion gallons of water are used per year in dialysis. That's enough to feed all the livestock in the United States for about a year. There's also a huge carbon footprint in creating in hemodialysis units and in, and in the manufacturing processes to create dialyzers and dialysates. In fact, there was an interesting article in Australia. I found that almost unbelievable where two thirds of the carbon footprint in Australia, they say came from hemodialysis, it just seems hard to believe. But anyway, that was their calculation. So in 2016, we began uh, the development of our device and we ended up with what we call modules and there's four of them. The first would be an ultrafiltration module and I'll describe what it does, nanofiltration module, 
electrodeionization module, and then a reverse osmosis module. And I won't go into all of this. This is just some of our earlier experiments uh, on the bench with all these different components. The ultrafiltration module, again, was like a glomerulus, had to prevent the cells in the blood and the proteins from getting into the synthetic urine. Because we can't, can't transport glucose um, individually like SGLT1 and 2, we had to do it by prevent in a, in a ultrafiltration or a filtration uh, mechanism by preventing the filtration of uh, glucose into the urine. And this is what was called nanofiltration. The ion transport, we had to develop new technology and these modules are called electrodeionization modules. I'll describe those. So the idea is right now, for the last 60 years, we've been using diffusion. We create a concentration gradient and then an ion moves across a membrane. Here we have no uh, solution on each side of the membrane that's different. We don't have a diffusion gradient because of a solution difference or a concentration difference. We had to come up with an approach that would specifically transport an ion similar to what a, a transporter does uh, in, 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 a, in a cell. And then the water reverse osmosis module that all this, you've all heard about that. That's what we use in the chronic dialysis units and a lot of our purified water comes from reverse osmosis. So this was the overall scheme of the technology. There'd be an input stream shown in red here it would go through the ultrafiltration membrane. Part of that would go to the venous stream. And then part of the, that would go to, there were two electrodeionization units in the, in the device, two modules that do the ion transporting. Nanofiltration is here, reverse osmosis here. I won't get into all the arrows in the back and forth, but just again, to reiterate the four different types of components and what each of them does. In addition uh, to that functionality, one needs computers, one needs ion sensors. Unlike a hemodialysis machine, we wanted to be able to measure the analytes that we were creating the final urine with. So measure sodium, measure potassium, measure the pH, that sort of thing. So we have feedback to know what we're doing. And then there's flows between each of these things. So like a dialysis machine, you need motors and pressure sensors and that sort of thing and valves. And this is an overall uh, schematic of the device. Again, the only thing I wanna convey here is its complexity. I'm not gonna go into each of the separate flows unless some of you would like me to do that later. So one of the um, discoveries with the work we've been doing is to create a new ultrafiltration membrane. It turns out that polysulfone and a lot of the membranes used in uh, dialyzers are just not uh, going to do the trick. First of all, they don't have the efficiency we need, especially if it's going to be implantable. And secondly, they have they tend to clot. Uh, and uh, because of that, um, over the last year or so, we developed um, a new type of ultrafiltration membrane that's called an NCILM. It stands for uh, nanocrystalline ionic liquid membrane. We've recently published a paper on it. And this is a scanning EM of the, of the membrane. The benefits of this uh, membrane is that it has a very, very thin active layer, much thinner than polysulfone. And that allows you to get much higher clearances for the same surface area than what are currently in dialyzers. And secondly, when we look at the ultrastructure, it has slit-like pores, which uh, when it was being created, were not planned. It just uh, fortuitously has these. And this um, uh, affects the sieving coefficients and other parameters that make this membrane uh, very suitable for what we're doing. Uh, we're also working on potentially commercializing this in dialyzers because um, it has a lot of properties that might be beneficial to our patients. And here's just some comparisons. Um, these are um, other commercially available membranes and the materials they're, they're made out of. But if you just look at the uh, ultrafiltration rate in liters per hour per meter squared, um, this NCILM is like is much, much higher, orders of magnitude better than the 
commercially available dialyzers than we use now. So uh, even if uh, the properties were the same, you would need much less, much smaller dialyzer to get the same effect, which, which would be a cost saving for companies that make dialyzers. As far as uh, albumin, we look at it two ways. We measure the albumin and the permeate going through the dialyzer. And you can see there's very little albumin compared to these others. And the rejection, you can look at it conversely, the rejection of albumin, what doesn't get through uh, is better. Now, this is something that could be modulatable. Uh, people are allowing more albumin to come through uh, to get rid of uh, pro albumin bound, protein bound uremic toxins. So in the dialyzers where they advertise that they're getting rid of more uremic toxins, these dialyzers just let more albumin through. There's nothing magic about them. They just uh, sacrifice the albumin permeability. Oh, I just wanted to say also that as far as uh, uremic toxins, we didn't uh, measure any of them in this experiment per se. We use lysozyme as a surrogate. Uh, lysozyme has approximately the same a molecular weight is beta-2 microglobulin. Beta-2 microglobulin is like 11.2 or 5, I can't remember exactly. And, and lysozyme is 14 point something kilodaltons. And what you see here compared to polycellphone, polycellphone um, doesn't let through most of, this is rejection. So it rejects most of the, by rejection, it means it doesn't permeate. So it doesn't allow about 70% of the lysozyme to get through, whereas the NCILM lets it all go through. So that was advantageous too. So presumably it would let beta-2 microglobulin go through very easily. And then one can look at sieving coefficient. Sieving coefficient is, is defined as the concentration in the solution before the, the membrane to the concentration after. And what's shown here are a bunch of commercial membranes, uh, also the glomerulus of the rat, the GFB, this plus blue plus signs here are occur or measurements of the sieving coefficient of the uh, native glomeruli. And the red here, the red dotted line is the NCILM. You can see here it has a very sharp cutoff, which is favorable when, when companies are assessing new dialyzer membranes, they want to have very sharp cutoffs where it just goes, cuts on and cuts off, goes to zero very rapidly instead of taking a longer time to, to die off. So it has very favorable sieving coefficient properties also. And that could be because of the slit-like pores. We don't know yet for sure why. And we've done studies where we've actually dialyzed rats. And the, you know, the volume of a rat is milliliters. You were talking very small volumes, but we actually were able to get a lot of data from the rats uh, using this membrane. And we've recently published a paper on this too just showing the proof of principle of using this, uh, it, it, not in an artificial kidney uh, ultrafiltration module, but in a dialyzer. So anyone who wants to create an artificial kidney has to deal with the transport issue because the filter just lets everything through. If you do nothing after the filter, the patient's gonna be dead in a matter of half an hour or an hour. I mean, everything is just gonna come out in liters huge volumes, the inappropriate concentration. So the elephant in the room is to be able to do the ion transport after you've created the filtrate. Uh, and that's what we spent the most time on. I decided a number of years ago to use uh, this type of technology called electrodeionization. It was actually invented by Katz in 1956. And he published his paper at, a, at an international water conference. Uh, he called it the present stat status of electric membrane demineralization. Demineral in fact, it's used today now to, uh, in, in addition to reverse osmosis units, to create uh, water that has very little ion content in it. And basically what this device has is a number of different components, which I'll go through. So the feed is your initial original solution, which has all the ions here, uh, gases, etc. Inside this part of the device are what are called ion exchange membranes. So let's say a cation exchanger uh, would be something that exchanges sodium for potassium. We used to use that clinically before the potassium binding uh, compounds that we now use. 
clinically. Um, and there are anion exchange um, resins also that will exchange, let's say, chloride for bicarbonate. So these are all in the middle. And then on each side is a membrane that either lets anions through or cations through. And then outside that are electrodes. So there's an electric field created here. And what one can do with this device is take this very messy solution in the middle and transport the cations to one side and the anions to the other, leaving a very high purity water in the middle. And I didn't mention, but the anion exchange, the ion exchange bees just increase the efficiency of the ion getting to the membrane here. So I decided years ago that this technology would be something to uh, use in our artificial kidney. The problem with, with what existed uh, until we really started our work was that it's very nonspecific. You can't distinguish sodium transport from potassium transport or chloride from bicarbonate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I recognize that what we would need to do would be to take this and somehow make it more specific, uh, which is what we did over the years. And not only that, but we created a device shown here that actually allows you or the computer to decide where it wants to uh, transport the ion. So within here, we have sodium selective, K selective, calcium, mag selective components, and the device can choose to transport sodium separately from potassium. Just be, and the electrodes are only shown here on the outside, but there's actually electrodes throughout here. So the computer can decide which electrodes uh, to use and that changes what ions are being transported. And we have a patent on this a number of years ago. Um, and we call this multiple mesh activated wafer electrode deionization. So the, the key is that the electric field can be applied individually or in combination. We are still working on the specificity of the transport. One chemistry or one approach that we're using is to change the chemistry of the cation exchange resin using uh, compounds called crown ethers. Actually, Don Cram won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1987 at UCLA for his invention of crown ethers. But basically, uh, they're, they're compounds that look like this, and they, in the inside, will retain either a cation or an anion based on the ring here. So he was able to create these compounds that will transfer uh, a cation or anion from one solution to another. And so what one approach we've been taking is to take 18 crown six, which is very potassium selective and attach it to these cation exchange beads and then use that as our cation exchange resin in the device. And this just shows an experiment where um, potassium is being transported and you can see you get better efficiency of potassium transport with the 18 crown six. And here's an experiment. This is done in vitro on the bench where we take a solution uh, that was originally had a potassium of four and spike it up to 18 and then turn on this electrodeionization unit and you can see the potassium coming back down as the potassium is being transferred to the uh, other solution or what we would call the synthetic urine. As far as the time, we have control over how fast it will work by just changing the current going through the device. Another problem we have, as I mentioned, is the glucose. Unlike nature that can transport glucose back into the blood, we cannot. So if we have an input stream of glucose going through the Alta filter, glucose will just go through the whole device and will come out in the urine. We'll basically have all the glucose lost in the urine. And so we have this other membrane that we call a nanofilter. And nanofilters uh, are known to have more restrictions on molecules the size of glucose and not allow them to come out. And we've tested a number of them. This combination of uh, nanofilters here rejects about 90% of the glucose. So 90% of the glucose that comes through the original ultrafiltration module can be sent back to the bloodstream. Um, the problem is, 
and and very little urea. The problem is getting these things uh, where we want based on what the other requirements of the device. And the problem we have is with urea because they they're very similar in size. And so yes, we can make the rejection of glucose uh, very nice, but it's always coupled to having urea also not coming through the rest of the device into the urine. And so we talk about all the time how much urea imbalance would be a problem if the BUN, let's say we have X amount of urea coming into the device and we only get rid of half of it, be analogous to your creatinine being two, and the BUN doubles, is that gonna be a major issue? Uh, probably not. So we can tolerate uh, not getting exactly input and output of urea being being equal, uh, we'll reach a point where we can't allow the BUN to go up higher the, than a certain level. But these are just some of the thoughts we have that we don't have to be perfect on the urea. But it's just very hard to have a membrane that that rejects all glucose but lets all urea through. It just doesn't exist commercially. We would have to create our own nanofilter, which we haven't done yet. Another issue we have, so this is the reverse osmosis unit. Remember, reverse osmosis is a methodology where you put a water with ions in it under high pressure and you drive the water because of that hydrostatic pressure through the membrane. And hopefully the membrane that you have will leave all the ions and won't let those go through. So we, we, we were just looking at a number of commercially available uh, membranes. Remember, it's not perfect. So reverse osmosis, will allow some ions to go through. It's not a, it, these membranes are not, are not perfect. This particular one, a commonly used one, uh, blocks 86% of the sodium, but 15% will go through with the water. But look here, urea is a problem also again. In all reverse osmosis membranes, urea actually can go through the membrane. And so this is a problem because not only are we going to be with the nanofilter blocking some of the urea from getting out into the rest of the device because it's blocking glucose and some of the urea that we want actually to get through, but the reverse osmosis module um, will allow urea that is in the urine stream before we get to this final part of the device back into the blood. So again, it comes back to how much urea can we tolerate going up if we're not in perfect urea balance or nitrogen balance? As far as how much urine to make, just like any reverse osmosis device, we just change the pressure and we can create whatever volume of urine we want uh, with the components that were there originally. Um, so we're not changing the uh, ion content, at least appreciably, because the ions don't appreciably get through the membrane, although some do, changing it a little bit. But basically, by changing the pressure, we can drive more or less urine through and send X amount of volume to the synthetic urine and X amount of urine, X amount of water back to the uh, body just by varying the pressure. Now, how we'll know what to do as far as that's concerned, we don't, we can't do it with sensors. For instance, with um, the electrodeionization units, we can have potassium or sodium or calcium sensors telling those devices what to do. But how do we decide how much the volume of urine should be? We don't have a sensor for how much water the patient drank. Uh, there are approaches that you all know of. Uh, one is just uh, weight. And so perhaps that would be the only way to decide. But to do this on an ongoing basis throughout the day um, is going to have to be a guess initially within a certain range and then fine tune it maybe based on the weight. Another approach to get around the urea uh, that we're doing right now is called vapor distillation. So uh, some of you remember, may remember this from uh, chemistry classes where you, well, distillation is just heating up a solution and creating steam and then condensing it again. So that's a great way of making pure water without salts in it. We didn't want to have to have the temperatures in our device that would be re required to do this. So another way to do it is called va vacuum distillation, where you uh, make a vacuum above the solution. And now the solution will boil at a much lower temperature. And you can lower that temperature more and more by just making 
a bigger and bigger vacuum. And so that's what we're actually doing now. We're, we're using vacuum distillation to totally separate the water from the rest of the components of the synthetic urine. And that way, be able to modulate exactly how much volume we want and not lose urea back to the blood and some of the other ions, as I showed on the previous slide. This just shows some of the output um, of, the, of your native kidney compared to uh, what the device can do. And we're off with, with certain things, but and with urea and creatinine, um, not as good. Creatinine, we don't really care about, but, um, and as I say, urea uh, is, is about a third of what we want, whether the, if the BUN triples, whether that's a problem uh, in patients, I doubt it. Uh, but we'll see. We've done some experiments in pigs, uh, and this was an experiment measuring. This is this is a pig where we removed the kidneys, uh, and we're measuring the urea in blood from the catheter blood, blood that returned in synthetic urine. And this just shows in yellow the urea going up and up and up as we're sending more of it to the synthetic urine out of the body. This is a CAD drawing of the device so far on the right shows a real picture. Uh, again, this is not a device yet. This is all being done in the lab. So it's not a commercially uh, available device. And these are just some of the different components. They look like hollow fiber kidneys. Um, if you had to compare them to anything, this is, there's components on the front and the back, which are not shown here, but this is the ultrafiltration membrane. This is the this is the nanofilter. This is the reverse osmosis unit. The electrodeionization units are on the back. So as far as our current uh, timetable, we hope to uh, have our final modification of the portable prototype. Initially, we were also talking like some of the other devices and companies that are out there of having wearable device. But again, my thought now is a wearable device for any human being makes absolutely no sense. First of all, most humans don't want to let anyone else know they're sick. I can't imagine people walking around uh, with these things on them, um, at least in public. And again, most people aren't walking all day. So I think these devices will be shrunken and kept on a table, either at home or at work. But portable does, just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and then hopefully pig trials uh, in about 12 months uh, to try to show proof of principle in, 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 in a living animal. To do human trials with these kind of things costs about $50 million. So that's why you don't see a lot of uh, uh, new technology that, that affects human beings. It's just to come up with a human trial for new devices that contact blood are just extremely expensive. So we'll we'll take it step by step and and do the pig trials first and hopefully if uh, we can show success in that regard, then we'll move on from there. The other potential additional applications of this technology are to regenerate PD and, and hemodialysate. We can control the chemistry uh, of the peritoneal fluid. And to some extent, we can't do everything, but it, it will allow other than what's currently being used, this sorbent technology where everything is bound, we can actually transfer the ions and some of the other analytes from one stream to another uh, to be discarded or not, uh, and potentially uh, utilize less uh, dialysate in that regard, both for hemo and PD. The, as I say, the approaches being taken now for uh, regenerating are having something that binds, binds phosphate, binds urea, um, binds potassium, and then after it, that cartridge or, or binding agent is saturated, you have to get rid of it. You know, there's nothing else, you, and you have to replace it. So they're, they're replaced every day. Whereas we won't have to do any replacing. Um, the lifetime of most of the components in our device, we feel, is at least a year. One, one of the problems, uh, the component that has the biggest problem is always the component in contact with blood, either from clotting or from fouling. So the clotting um, is, as, as the word says, the fouling is from proteins binding to the surface. 
And there are a number of ways now of modifying the surface of these ultra filters. Um, one, one favorable approach is, is to use what are called zwitter ions. These, these are compounds that have a different charge based on the pH. Um, and you can sort of fine tune the charge you want. And uh, they tend to stop platelets and the clotting factors from starting their ca cascade. They're used um, in a number of different um, devices that are in contact with blood. So if, if necessary, we, we can modify the NCILM membrane, although it has very good uh, fouling and clotting properties as it is right now. So we're not sure we're gonna have to do that. And these are just some of the folks that I'm working with. Uh, Roland Ludlow is CEO of the company I'm working with, U.S. Kidney Research Corporation. Jamie Hestigan is a chemical engineer at the University of Arkansas. And these are just some of the postdocs and students working on the project. And these are the sources of the funding we've received thus far. And uh, that's where we are at this point in time. And I look forward to any questions you might have. Thanks for listening. All right, I wanted to ask, first of all, thank you, Dr. Kurtz, for that presentation. I think I wanted to ask, um, or actually make one, one, one comment. I, I sent you a message about it. So I know Dr. Gura personally, and even though you're right, there remains a great deal of stuff to work out on his whack. Um, he's overcome a lot of adversity, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that might be a nice intermediate step to get more people out of in-center dialysis, which is a big directive. That came up in 2019, as you mentioned. No, I'm I, I'm aware of that I'm 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 thinking more just from a human brain point of view. I can't, and maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe there are a group of people that will walk around with this, you know, pumps, blood coming out into the device, motors, computers. I mean, it would have to get very very small in my view. It would have to get very small. Maybe it will. Um, yeah, like an iPhone. If it's that size, I think possibly. But uh, the other thing so, is people don't walk all day. So if you're sitting at a desk, why do you need it on your body? That's It's having it on your body that makes no sense to me when it could be on a table. I think that or implanted. And I guess at that point, you know, or, it's just what they're doing. Well, it's implanted they right? can't do because they've got dialysate. They're going to have to have water going in and out. They, I mean, anything that uses an external source of water cannot be implantable unless you're willing to put dialysis in and out of a patient through their skin into an internal dialyzer. But basically all you've done then is taken the hemodialysis machine implanted and implanted it. it. That makes no sense to me. Well, I mean, bad joke, but I guess Apple can call it eye kidney or IP, right? Yeah. Something like that. No, I mean, I think I think if you have no other choice in a country where there is absolutely no other choice, and you are walking around all day, you'll wear it. It's the attachment to the human body, like a cyborg, that I just don't understand. Well, uh, that is a very good point, and I think it does the future. I really like, and I wanted to thank you for uh, the covering the approximation of biological processes with mechanical materials that's going on in the minds of developers of artificial kidneys. This is really important work. And I know Dr. Lau and I had spoken about if there's any way to kind of get in on this. It would be a good thing for the UCI campus. Now I'm going to open it up to my colleagues. Does anybody else have any questions for Dr. Kurtz? Hi, this is Dr. Lau. Thank you for sharing all the work you've been doing. I guess, realistically, do you envision that the uh, platforms and structures for these could shrink down any further, or it's just that not feasible? I think it'll be in phases. I, you know, I think the hardest thing for the federal government to approve is an implantable device. Um, not because of its functionality, but because every time something goes wrong, you have to make, you have to do an operation. And so I think even though people talk about it, we talk about implantable, I think it might end up being a pipe dream. I think it's going to be probably a combination of both where you have some of the components 
small enough, like Rami was alluding to, like an iPhone that you're wearing, uh, and some of it internal. To have the entire device internal, it would have to, you know, work for at least a year, year and a half. People are not going to accept swapping components and, you know, so, and that's going to be hard to prove. So I think, I think we're years off from that. I think with these artificial devices, I think probably it'll be a combination of wearable with some internal. I think the only thing that's going to be totally internal is going to be the xeno, xenographs. But when the xenographs occur, I think all of nephrology is going to have a sea change, just like AI, GPT-4. You're going to have every single patient in every single dialysis unit in this country being able to be transplanted, at least if they're medically able to do it. Uh, so the dialysis units are going to empty out. And every single nephrologist will become a transplant nephrologist. And every nephrologist is going to have to focus much more on transplant. Dialysis is going to be something that's done, but it's not going to be, you know, as prevalent as it is, obviously. And if you couple to that, the solving uh, diabetic nephropathy, which some bright young 19-year-old is going to do within the next 15, 10, 10 years or so. I mean, you know, you've lost half of the half of the nephrology patients on the, in the on the planet. So I think for the fellows, and then with AI coming on board and the rest of it, I mean, nephrology is going to see major, major changes in the next 10 years. And, uh, you know, the people that, that succeed are going to be the ones that embrace this. But in those three areas, AI, transplant, and, and, and diabetic nephropathy, I think you're going to see the biggest biggest changes in nephrology. So for our device, I don't, I mean, I didn't really answer your question, is the problem shrinking it or could it be? I think once it works perfectly, shrinking it is a problem, but it's not a scientific discovery like we're having to do now. It's a matter of taking the components and making them smaller. It doesn't require the same type of creativity. That's more of an engineering technical issue. But even if that was done, I guess the point I'm making is the far more difficult thing is to show how long the components can last. Now, the EDI components we know can last a year or more. In our device, once you get through the ultra filter, nothing else sees blood or clotting factor. So it's just that, you know, it's like the glomerulus. The glomerulus is the is the is 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 protecting the rest of the kidney. The glomerulus gets hit, you know. The 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 ultrafiltrate in the proximal tubule and the rest of the nephron is seeing an ultrafiltrate. No protein, you know. No clotting factors. No blood cells. No platelets. So if, it's the same thing for us. We have we would have to know that that ultrafilter can last, you know, a year or, or years. Uh, when exposed to blood and have the same properties or close to the same properties before we would even entertain doing anything else. Once we've solved that, then yes, we would have the reliability because the rest of the device would not be have problems because of exposure to blood. It would just be the components which we could test on a bench. So it, it's getting the ultra filter. And that's true of all artificial kidneys, the UCSF project with their silicon nanofilter. In fact, the FDA always wants to see that. They want to know how your device interacts with blood. Does it, is there clotting? And that's prescient. That's actually the correct question. But yeah, blood is a horrible environment for any device. It clots, it attacks, it inflames. It doesn't necessarily want to flow. And with that, I wanted to thank you, Ira, Dr. Kurtz, for your uh, graciously offering so much of your time to our uh, to your little sister institution here at UCI. And we look forward to uh, ever closer bonds and ties with UCLA. Uh, Dr. Lau, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, 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 that was fantastic. All right. Thank you. All right. I just guys. want to add one comment. Go uh, ahead, Dr. Lau. No, no. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. First, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ira Curtis. Amazing presentation. Uh, as usual, I learned so much from you and from, by the way, Dr. Ira has a YouTube channel. I encourage everyone to, uh, you know, sign up for it. It's really great, helpful for education. Uh, I just want to say like uh, two comments. I really like, uh, I'm proud of a because you said that 
creating an artificial kidney is uh, more harder than creating a heart. So, so that we beat cardiologists. That's great. <laughs> the other thing I say is, uh, you know, like I think honestly, I mean, we welcome all advances in sciences, uh, zero transplantation, artificial kidney, everything like great. But to me, the common sense solution to living kidney donation. I mean, what's going on here? I mean, I think uh, I feel like there's a lot of money was spent mm -hmm. and this was great. But really, there are some simple solutions that are more cost effective if we can educate the public about you know how we can get living kidney donors and and give them Medicare, give the kidney donor Medicare. You know they are healthy people, and I think we're gonna solve this you know issue with the Alice Center. Um, uh, so that's what I would like to say only. And thank you so much. Yeah, no, that's a very important point. I mean that if that could be done, you wouldn't need any of these things. So, and be cost effective as well. Yes. I mean, you know, there were arguments for a regulated market. I remember Danovich here used to argue, he, he had uh, debates with other people as to whether um, patients should be paid for donating kidneys. And it was estimated that each kidney is worth about $100,000, I remember at the time. But uh, I mean, he's dead set against it. He feels that it would, it would, fav it would, it would attract poor patients who lie about their medical history and all, all sorts of other issues. I think in Iran, they have a, a regulated market. It seems to be working well. So, I mean, I don't know a lot about it, so it can be done. Yes, I mean, or we also, can all, or we can all well, opt yeah. in to be organ donors, right, Dr. Omari? Well, I, I think, I mean, just I'm, I'm talking about like uh, a reliable solution, sustainable, is that uh, I know the paid that uh, issue, I, I don't say I'm against uh, payment, but why not giving Medicare to every donor? What's you know, what's the problem with that? You know, uh, because on, as a donor, uh, they're afraid of what's going to happen to them, and many of them they are uh, from low socioeconomic status. They're struggling to live their life, and now you're asking them to donate their kidney to their loved one, and uh, what they're going to happen to them. So I think, from a from a federal standpoint, uh, I mean to me, the common sense just give Medicare. In my view, this will increase living donation by at least fifty percent. I mean, so. that's true. Obviously, living donation is important, but I was referring to Spain and the deceased donor uh, opt in, sorry, opt out versus opt in here. Uh, I think that's something. I mean, I'm an organ donor after I die because I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be needing my kidneys then. So I'm happy to pass them on to someone else. Yeah, yeah, that's the fun topic. <laughs> you know, part of driving all this innovation is not uh, the logic that for as you were referring to um to solve this more easily it it's it's the it's the cost of kidney care in the u.s i remember a few years ago the federal government was spending 114 billion dollars it might be even more this is like two three years ago on all of kidney care which is like one eighth of the entire medicare budget medicare budget is about a trillion dollars a year and something like one eighth or one ninth was spent on kidney care so it wasn't that these people uh, in the White House and in the federal government suddenly fell in love with the kidney. It's just costing them too much. So anything that's going to increase the amount of money they they have to spend uh, is not something favorable, which is sort of paradoxical because they're putting no money into these projects. I mean, these are all, we're funding this ourselves. You know, um, NIH grants are a joke. They're like, two, these projects cost, you know, $20, $30 million. Uh, they're very complicated. So... I mean, but it's nothing compared to what they're spending now on kidney care. You would think they would see that, but no, they don't. They want other entities to solve these this renal replacement therapy. But, you know, there are slow things happening, but certainly since, uh, and we've won the kidney X a few times, but none of these things yet have come to clinical uh, care. And uh, it's just very hard to create a new device that interacts with blood and get it FDA approved. And as I say, just the human trials are 30 to $40 million, even if you do have a device. So it's very hard road. It's a very hard road. Well, with that, uh, dialysis is a, it's just an amazing technology that Kolf came up with. It's elegant, simple, and it works. And with that, does anybody have any other questions we can uh, direct towards Dr. Clear Kurtz? All right. Well, uh, unless somebody wants to uh, speak up, I hereby pronounce this meeting adjourned.
It's a pleasure to see you all. I hope you're all in good health and see you guys uh, at clinic tomorrow. Be well. Bye. Thank you.